Check one, two, one, two, three. Gary, do you see the bounce? Bouncing Gary. And the other mic is still coming through. This one still seems louder. Same on your end? Okay. Welcome, y'all. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? All right. Uh, welcome. Welcome um, to the first ever public lecture series offered by Services for Transfer and Reentry Students. Uh, and I'm thrilled that y'all are joining us here today. Uh, my name's Sarah Radoff, and I'm the director of STARS. And we're doing three public lecture series. The first one is today, the Transfer Students Dropping Knowledge. 
uh, two weeks from now, we're talking about scholar activists and seeing how people have used research to really make a difference in the world. Uh, and then the last one's called Change Makers, and that's all about taking leadership roles to create the world that you want to create for yourself, your families, and your communities. Uh, and it was intentional by design to start with talking uh, and hearing directly from transfer students. And the reason is that, interestingly enough, there's a debate in academia about where knowledge comes from. Who possesses knowledge? Who creates knowledge? And one of the things that uh, we have a lot of conviction around in STARS uh, and our support for transfer students is that knowledge comes from our students, from our community. And so you're going to be hearing today from transfer students who have a wealth of information about their personal experiences, insights that they want to pass on to you. And so without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Eric Ramirez, our moderator for the panel. Can everyone hear me? I feel that I can hear correctly. All right, cool. So I'm going to ask right now the panelists to come here. Um, but before that, um, I just want to uh, cover why we're doing this and uh, trying to echo a little bit about what Sarah um, shared right now. Um, is that we want you all to feel that this university um, represents you, but also represents your identity, right? It's important for you to hear what are the experiences of these other transfer students who at one point were here in your position right now, right? Um, whatever um, position that would be right now. But I, I want you all to feel what, um, what worked for them, right? might work for you specifically. And so we develop, I developed these questions specifically to tackle those things. I want you all to understand the difficulties that students um, deal with here on this campus, but also how they strive, what worked for them specifically, right? So um, I want to welcome um, the panelists here to come over here and have a seat with me so we can have a discussion about um, some of the questions that um, might really resonate with you. All right, so the way that is going to work is that it's going to be mostly like a discussion. We want you, um, these students to understand, uh, they, to share what are the things that they work, what, what things work for this university for them. So I've allowed them to um, really just share whatever they um, think is important for this specific panel. So I have a series of questions. Um, they've already sort of looked at them, but I'm going to allow them to um, really just express whatever they want to express regarding that question. So um, the first um, thing that I want you all to do is introduce yourself. Um, what, is the, uh, major, what is your major? What year um, you're here at this university? Testing. OK. Wasn't sure if that was going to work. So my name is Cosmic Moore. I am in the Master's in Education program. I originally came to UCSC. I transferred in for my bachelor's uh, in mathematics. And you said you wanted to go a little bit into that? OK. So I chose mathematics because it was at an intersection of a lot of other things I was interested in, neuroscience, engineering, computer science, uh, economics, everything. And then as time went on, and I didn't find a problem that was really interesting in mathematics, I switched over to, well, I got interested in education as a means for me to kind of discover more about learning, how people learn, the human condition. It turns out that if you ever get into education, it gets to be a really, really deep subject. The reasons I think that these things are important is because math is, part, is everywhere in our modern world and our education and our education system is, incre uh, is becoming increasingly important but often does not receive the attention that it deserves. So I want to help out with that. 
Oh, and one thing I wanted to add is uh, what Sarah was saying about students making their own knowledge, I would really take that to heart because there's a lot of education research that shows that that's exactly what's required is, is building on student understanding. So all of your understanding is extremely important to this academic endeavor. Um, hello, hi, can you hear me? Hi, all right, so my name is Chelsea, Chelsea Ndong. I'm a first year transfer student. I transfer from Cabrillo College and I'm also an international student from Gabon, Central West Africa. And um, my major is business, man business management. Uh, why? Because I love the whole idea about business, just, just that. And um, that's, that's me. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Arturo. I'm a fourth year transfer student. I'm a computer science major. I, I came from Santa Rosa Junior College last year and um, hopefully gonna be finishing up at the end of this year. So I chose computer science because I like engineering and I like to come up with solutions and, and use software to, to make, uh, make other people's lives better. I'm Heather Willoughby. I'm a transfer student to this university initially in 2000 for marine biology, and now I'm a re-entry student finishing my degree in biology. I downgraded because I, um, I wanted a major that was more applicable to more um, things so that I could support my family. Yeah, fine. Testing, testing. Uh, higher. Testing. Test. Right. Can you can you do this one too? Testing. Yeah. Good. Uh, better. See. Yeah. Yeah. All right. When I started this, my name is Angel de Jesus Mora. I'm from Mission College in Santa Clara. I'm from San Jose. I'm a sociology major. I like to share that I didn't choose sociology. Sociology chose me. I went to education uh, at community college when I was right off the streets. You know, I was homeless, I was a drug addict, and I took a class uh, in sociology, social problems, it was talking about gangs, it was talking about drug addicts, and I didn't like the misrepresentation and the misunderstanding of people that come from walks of life like me, so I like to say that that opened me up to become a sociologist, and I'm in the field because I like to, I like to tackle educational uh, stereotypes, I like to tackle what it means to be a student, a traditional student versus a non-traditional student. And in sociology, I've been able to do so with some of the work that I do, and uh, thank you all for being here. All right, so owning space is defined as feeling that you are heard and represented in a setting or environment. Therefore, owning space in this institution is important for self-advocacy. How have you owned your space on campus? What has this looked like for you? When I first transferred here, which I forgot to mention was from Bakersfield College down south, I did not feel very connected to any communities either there or here. I had a couple of identities that I brought with me namely that of a veteran, that of a person who was interested in the sciences and the mathematics, but not a whole lot else. And even during my time here, uh, when I was studying mathematics, I never really found a community to plug myself into. And that's something that we as transfer students, I think, need to be really aware of because I uh, just didn't have the time. You know, we have different requirements put upon us, you know, other things that we have to worry about that we, so we may not have time to fully plug into the university experience. It wasn't until I really found something that I could be passionate about, namely education, that I finally found a community I could belong to. And that allowed me to find a space that I could expand out into to develop my own voice, learn how to speak, learn what I wanted to speak about. So, um, how have I owned that? just getting more involved, 
speaking out, developing my thoughts, developing my writing, and really trying to dig down deep into the things that I think are important. So, passion. Can I ask a follow-up question? Yep. So, um, you mentioned that um, owning a space for you is to sort of um, speak out, right, and, and, and work with that. But how much time did it take you? Did it take, does it still take time? Is it still there um, in which you're still trying to figure that out? Or um, have you already figured it out? It is an ongoing process. Uh, in one respect, you could say, let's see, I'm 35 now. It took me 33 years to find my voice. In other ways, you could say I started to find it two years ago, and then I've, I'm sorry, not 34 years. Um, that I only found it recently, and I'm still working on it, still trying to figure it out. I've met people, and you guys will meet people too, and assuredly already have, who are very sure of themselves. They're very, uh, they have found their voice. They know what they're doing. And uh, if you're anything like me, that can be a little bit intimidating because you start asking yourself, well, why haven't I found mine yet? So it's an ongoing process. I feel better than I did yesterday, and I think I'll feel better tomorrow. Whoever wants to respond, it doesn't have to be chronological. Um, so in owning my own space, um, I came to this university as a single student parent. And when I initially got here, I went to the Oprah's Fall Fest where all the organizations show up. And I went to every single organization. I went to the Women's Center. I was like, what do you guys do for student parents? And they're like, uh, uh, well, we'll get back to you on that one. And I was like, okay, okay. And then I went to the next one, and I went to the next one. I kept on looking for, like, where's my people? Where, am I, where are my people at? <laughs> where's my support group? And I, I really had a hard time locating that initially. Um, I had previously used the STARS program when I was first a transfer student before I was ever a parent. And so I went into the STARS program and really leaned on them quite a bit. And I really, um, I feel like they gave me the, the agency to create better representation for student parents. Like they gave me the tools to go and find the ways that my voice needed to be heard. Um, and currently, you know, we're trying to start a student parent organization and we're trying to really create representation on this campus like other campuses have already done to kind of mirror what they do to support and, and um, kind of create like, um, a more welcoming space for both off-campus and on-campus student parents. So I'll ask a follow-up question for that too. Um, and I'm curious for, for you to share, is that how did you feel when you first arrived to this campus knowing that like, as a student parent, someone needed to get back to you about that? It was an immediate response, right? Like it wasn't like, oh, here you go. There, there it is. It's like you needed to navigate that by yourself. And so I want to, to hear your thoughts about how that made you feel when you arrived. And um, it, did, it, did it make you feel more passionate about being here at school um, because of that? Or did it make you feel like you just didn't want here? You didn't want to be here? I think initially I felt disenfranchised. Like I just felt like, oh wow, there's no student parent community here. Like that doesn't happen. Um, but it definitely, um, I'm, I'm a biology major. So, you know, I, it's a little out of my wheelhouse, the social justice and the, the creation of the things along with it, you know, but it definitely, it spurred me on to be more vocal and be more involved and active and um, over the summer I went to the the organizing summit for the student union and there I was able to like really find the tools that I needed to help move things forward here on campus and, and a better understanding of like the the structure of the university as well. Thank you. <laughs> Before I answer the question, I just want to be mindful of letting you all know that it's been a culmination of experiences throughout my life. I definitely didn't wake up like this one day without putting in work and without having a you know, set of resources and people having my back. But one of the things that I used to own my space was uh, I get asked the question often since I came here, where do you feel most at home? My response is always wherever I'm standing. 
I, I've learned to love myself, respect myself, and hold myself to a levels of integrity that I never did before. Uh, with that said, I carry all my family tradition, my ancestry, and I hold those to ground me, and I hold those to the utmost respect ever. And I don't expect people to be like me or look like me. Um, I expect y'all to be yourselves, to love yourselves, be the creative person that you are. So when I'm navigating myself in this campus, some of me and the homies will talk like, this is my barrio, this is my neighborhood. You know, I pay $35,000 a year just like everybody else, right? <laughs> I'm trying to be a satisfied customer, you know what I mean? <laughs> they call us students, but we're also customers, right? So, you know, I know all you guys go and get something to eat, and if they don't bring the right order, you say, excuse me, but this is not what I ordered. We need to learn how to do that here, right? Because this is our place, this is our territory. You know, whoever you are from whatever walk of life you are, this is your barrio, this is your neighborhood, this is your home. Make it your home, right? So that's, that's where I come in. And just by exposing myself to the community, my first quarter here, I was chilling with my homeboy and uh, we're singing corridos, which are Mexican folktales. And we're singing them outside of humanity, just minding our own business. And then people just started joining us and we're like, damn, like those fuckers feel comfortable with each other, you know? It was like, well, <laughs> well, yeah, I feel comfortable with myself because people always hated on me. People always told me I was a loser, that I wouldn't amount to nothing. My principal high school teacher told me I'd be dead by age 25 or locked up. I'm 29 and I'm still standing, you know? So, you know, people always told me left or right that I was never going to amount to nothing, but yet here I am. Here I am, proud to be who I am, you know, proud to be the person that I'm striving to be and working with different communities from different vast backgrounds, right? So, you know, if I can say anything to you today is embrace yourself, enjoy, embrace your community, embrace where you're going, embrace where you've been, because that's, that's what it's going to take along with the culmination of resources and people supporting you and telling you, que si se puede, yes, it's possible, yes, you're going to do it but also it takes you understanding yourself and understanding who you want to be. At the end of the day, you got to serve yourself too, right? So definitely get it and don't forget that, you know, we students, but we customers, so let's make them, let's make them work, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the following question. Okay. Interacting with faculty can be daunting for a lot of our students. Can you describe experience, your experiences interacting with faculty? What recommendations do you have for speaking with faculty? I'm Hal and Arturo, you guys have like, more to say about this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was at community college, I never really uh, reached out to my professors ever like I never went to office hours I never talked to my TAs or anything uh, ever since I've been here it's been a lot harder because the classes are 10 times bigger um, but what has worked for me was going to office hours with the TAs or with the professor um, because that one-on-one -on -one is really worth it like you're paying all this money to be here if you're not going to take that extra step you know to go into the office hours to get comfortable with them to ask them questions you know um, it's gonna be a lot harder. And that's what they're here for. So it took me a while to figure that out, but um, since I started doing that, it's been a lot, a lot more helpful for me. I'll ask a follow-up question. Um, did you feel, um, did you have a negative interaction with the faculty member before? Yeah. Can so, you talk a little bit about that? So something that I found being here in this uh, institution, you know, it's a research institute, I understand that. With that being said, like a lot of the professors that I've had come here, not because they like to teach, but because they want research and they want the money. So I've had some professors that I don't like per se, and I don't think that they like to teach, but my best solution for that was, um, and this is just in STEM, so I don't know how it is for um, humanity majors, but for me, I looked for MSI tutors, I looked for TAs, because I know that they have a different perspective and they actually want to be, be here to help you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, I just want to say that I had like the opposite of what I really had. Uh, even when I was before college, I used to talk all the time with my professor just because I'm that type of person. I just, emailing is nice but i just feel like going to office hours and have a face-to-face -face talk help me better and uh, since i've been here i've been doing the same thing and uh i think teacher they, they're here they're, they they always welcome they're always open 
for you to come in and just check in with whatever questions, trouble, whatever. And I think he has been very helpful for me, even with um, major Iverson and uh, college Iverson. Whenever I need to choose a class, I have trouble, like I'm not sure which class to take and all of that. I'm always seeing one of them or with my international advisor too. I have a problem with my visa. I have a problem with my, my statue. Like, I don't know, anything. I-20, I'm just going there or email her and they help me. They just, they're here for that. And they're expecting you guys to reach out to them. So I don't know. I think, yeah, you should like use that. You should use them. Anybody want to add something? so kind of just narrowing a little bit what's been said already um the couple of notes i wrote office hours for sure take advantage of them that is a big deal it's free time that the professors have to set aside for you they're required and if they're not upholding their end of that deal like on hell would say just you got to push in. They owe you something. You paid for it. Um, that being said, be polite, be respectful, but be insistent. Um, I, don't, I can't speak for a whole lot of departments. I can only speak for two, really, although I have heard some horror stories about computer science. It seems like they might have a consistently just terrible experience. <laughs> I don't know. You can speak more on that, I assume. <laughs> but um, mathematics is similar in that a lot of the professors, they're here to do research. And... Similar can be said for their grad students. That being said, they're a very polite, nice, and often helpful bunch. But they're not going to reach out. They did not reach out to me. I had to reach out to them. But when I did reach out to them, they were always willing to help. Um, the education department, on the other hand, they're, they're a bunch of huggers. They will, they will pull you in. They will keep an eye on you more so than the mathematics department will and probably a lot of other departments. So you really need to get to know your own department kind of in keeping with what we said earlier about identity, that needs to be part of your identity is, is, you know, I mean, if you want to make it so. It's pushing in there and saying, hey, I belong in here too. And so, you know, I'm going to be part of this community and that involves regularly interfacing. And email is great, but talking to people is much better. It has that personal touch. We're all still human for the most part. And um, we respond to human cues. So you want that face-to-face -face interaction as much as you can get it. Uh, speaking from the biology department, you're here for such a finite amount of time as a transfer student and as a re-entry student, sometimes even more finite. Um, get to know those professors you resonate with right away. Like, like go to their office hours. Are they hosting something? Go to that. Like, send them cute little emails about something that you read in science. Like. You know, make sure that you make that connection because those are the people's labs you need to get into like right away. Like you need to start working in the lab and doing your internships and, you know, all of those things so that, you know, you can move forward in your, your career in the future or your education, get those letters of rec, all those things. Talk to them. Talk to those people that you connect with because it's like anything. Those are going to be your, your, your pillars. know them it's good to just know that as soon as you possibly can because your time here is very limited do you want to respond yeah just jumping off piggybacking off the sentiment definitely uh, hold yourself with respect you know be polite as much as you can find your own recipe whatever that looks for you I've had both good experiences bad my great experiences were at community college where the professors weren't as research oriented but uh, I'm a very boisterous individual, so believe you me, when I was told I don't have time, I said, make time, please. <laughs> I said, that's what I pay you for. <laughs> and, and it wasn't a popular response to the professor, but at that point, I felt disrespected, so I said, please make time. That's what you're here for. You know, you're here to serve me, right? You signed up to be this professor as I signed up to be this student. So let's work together. Let's meet halfway. Please do what you need to do. Don't treat me like everyone else did in education. Show me you're different. Mm. And that happened to work, you know, and... I've had other professors one time where 
uh, we started off really rocky in a sociology class and uh, I went to our office hours. We had a really down to earth conversation and I missed class one day because I was really ill and she emailed me and said, hey, you were in class. Like, what happened? And I emailed her, oh, I was ill, you know, I apologize. And it showed me that if you do that, if you connect to them on that human level, like they're speaking on this panel, they're going to reach out to you, right? Because they show that you care, that you're a proactive student, that you're actually getting your money's worth, right? So it definitely, definitely does help to go and talk to these professors. Be humble, be kind, use whatever recipe works for you. You know, all of us have different interactions. We all did it differently, but we all got results that we wanted. So whatever it looks like for yourselves, do that. But don't forget, like, don't be afraid to use that line. I mean, this, I pay you for this shit. Let's get it. You know, like, for real, like, don't, don't be afraid to make them go to work because, you know what, a lot of us in K-12 through and community college didn't have great experiences, but you know what, let's change that narrative. Let's get together and say, nah, Charlie, Holmes, you work for me, don't you forget it, you know? So, like, when you're vacationing, don't forget who put you there, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All of us. So, you know, I just want to, I just want to reiterate that whatever recipe works for you and however that looks like, Use it to the full extent, you know, get your success by any means necessary. Get it, advocate for yourselves, ask us for help, ask whatever resources we're going to share shortly, ask them for help because we're a community. Let's work together and let's get it. There's a lot of passion here that you didn't notice. That's why we picked them. All right. Um, third question. Imposter syndrome is referenced as a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and is a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Many of our transfer students have faced imposter syndrome. Have you faced imposter syndrome during your undergraduate career? When was this and how did you navigate it? So in computer science, I'm probably like less than five um, percent of the people that look that look like me, but that that's been pretty hard, you know. Just being one of the only like underrepresented students in my classroom, and when I'm coding, when I'm practicing for my tests, it's I do get that a lot. Like I don't really think I should be in those upper diff classes or those um, programming classes that are pretty challenging. Um, the way that I have found to deal with it was finding a community. So I joined organizations in STEM, in computer science, and then also just talking to friends about it because they, they're going to support you. And sometimes it just takes another person from outside to, to tell you that you do belong there. Um, in, in programming in general, there's a lot of imposter syndrome. I think every like developer that I talk to get, tells me the same thing. Um, but at the end of the day, like, you got this far and you, sh you do belong here. So ju just a heads up is that we have about 10 minutes, but I want to, um, for all of you to try to respond to this question because I think it's really important. Then we'll move on into Q&A. Well, I'm a 43-year-old swimming in 20-somethings out here. So I, I think that, like, imposter syndrome is kind of like, yeah, but I will say that, like, actually, as a transfer student in my, like, mid-20s, it was much harder. I think I cared more about appearances or things, you know, and was more self-conscious and not as seated in my personality as I am now. And now, after, you know, being a mother and having my boob out most of the time and, you know, my belly C-section is, you know, like, I stopped caring about superficial things. And, like, so suddenly for me, as a 43-year-old in classes, I feel way better than I did as a 27-year-old in classes, because um, I just don't have I don't, I don't have time for that shit anymore. <laughs> like I just got to get this shit done and go. Um, but yeah, just like let go of you know like if you're feeling like you're not enough or any of that, like just sit with it and let it go. Like you are here, you are amazing, you are kicking ass. Right. I experienced uh, imposter syndrome probably about, I did early move-in last year, so I wasn't in the classroom setting, and I was 28 when I came here, and I needed a sober community because I'm five years clean, uh, fully abstinent, 
from drugs and alcohol. Uh, that was tough for me being in an environment with, you know, the, the younger 20 year olds, late teens, trying to party and experiment, you know, trying to find themselves, if you will. Uh, but I went through that at a very uh, early age in life. So it wasn't until I hit the classroom. It wasn't even a classroom, actually. It was, uh, some, you know, kind of like a sociology recruitment thing that Tina actually hosted. And there was professors in there talking about their research and talking about their work. And I met some grad students. And I remember there was uh, some people working with, like, the incarcerated population, formerly incarcerated population. And then I remember after I stuck around, I, I, I talked to this professor who doesn't do the work in that, but he had some really great uh, topics that he was discussing. And I remember just having that fascinating conversation with them and him listening to me, uh, listening to each other. Those feelings started going away. And then day one in the classroom, when I found out, yeah, it's, you know, 500 students, but I took a really look hard, hard look in the mirror and I said, it's the same shit, different platform from community college. Like you wrote five pages in community college, now you're writing eight pages. You know, you did research at community college, you're still doing research here. You're still using citations, you're still using those skill sets that you had, right? So it was about transferring those skills over that helped me reduce that imposter syndrome because then it was like, I am here and I'm here to play. I'm here to ball out. So once I figured out how to do that, I think I started reducing that imposter syndrome because all my life I've been told I wouldn't do none. So I stopped letting that bother me a long time ago and started learning how to transfer a different set of skills to different platforms. And I think that if you can do that, um, along with building friendships, uh, joining clubs, doing resources, if you can find your community, all that's going to ease it as well. Um, I found a sober community for me here on campus. Uh, we're actually at the Cove down by Oprah's. If y'all ever want to go in there, free, co free coffee, free printing, please come through and kick it. We got a nice spot. We're the only place where they see too, by the way, for students. So when it gets hot, come through. Uh, so yeah, so I found my community and that helped me reduce those levels of imposter syndrome. And if we can do anything, um, I work for stars. I work at the Cove. I'm always around. If you see me, you're having a bad day, come and say, hey, homie, I need you to lift me up and let's get it. I was going to say, if you could correct, give a response. Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I haven't really experienced anything that big like you guys, but I do remember like my first quarter here, I took this math class. And uh, during the first couple of days, the professor always like say stuff like, oh, I'm not going to go over it because you already learned that last quarter. And I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> no, not quite. And um, that was maybe, I mean, that, that was one time when I felt like I wasn't maybe in the right class. I ended up dropping the class and I'm kind of scared to take it because I still have to take the class because it's one of the requirements for my major. But I would say that was one time that I had that imposter syndrome. Not that big of a deal, but I think it could happen. As a student, I'm pretty sure that some of you are going to experience that like the professor saying that oh we you already learned that last quarter but you did not really you did but not in the sense that he thinks you did but yeah cool do you know, want to add something houseman yeah sure yeah. so imposter syndrome is definitely something that i have dealt with for a good portion of my adult life um, I had it at the community college. I brought it here with me and near as I can tell, the only thing that has really helped, like on health said is just, um, finding that community, finding that place to be and finding those people who can help you kind of pull yourself out of that hole where you've started to say, I don't know if I'm worth it. And oftentimes those people will be there to, to point out specifically, these are people who are going to know about you. They're going to know you hopefully well enough that they can tell you no we can actually we can actually see where you are very much worth it so um i think what i want to say is it it gets better and for certain as you get older like you know so a lot of you are going to be younger than me and it's kind of hard to pull yourself out of that mental space right now but i guarantee you there's just going to come a day where you're just not going to care as much it's not going to be important and right now, the thing to do, I think, is just take a look at your past, look at where you came from, and really sit down and look at it. A lot of times, we sell ourselves so short. 
we say, well, I did this, and you don't realize that in order to do this, you had to do this, 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 and this to get there. So look where, you're com look where you've come from, look where you are, and especially look forward to where you want to be because that's really what's going to, I think what's going to help you get through it is having that goal and saying, you know what, I don't care if I feel like I'm worth it. I don't even care if people are telling me I am not worth it. I think I am worth it. I think I can do this. It's called a, it's called a growth mindset. And as long as you think you can, that's the first step. But if you don't think you can, you're just never even going to start. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right, so we have a couple minutes for um, a Q&A. So, um, Sarah, how many minutes do we have? 15 for Q&A, perfect. Yes. All right, so I want to allocate this time to, for um, the audience, for you all, to um, share any questions um, for any of our panelists here. They all have uh, certain experiences on this campus. They all share um, different stories and also resonate between the stories. So um, I want to allow um, for you all to ask any of the questions. And uh, Sarah or Odessa, can you help me um, pass the mic? So if you have any questions, um, if you can write it down in the index card, and then I'll ask the question. Type it. Oh, type it. Oh, you can type it. All right. So we have two people who are watching online, which is pretty cool. Um, so this is for them specifically, um, is that if you have any questions, you can type it out, then we can have it over here, and then um, we can share those responses. That's specifically for those who are online. No, um, uh, Odessa is going to collect the index cards. Yeah. Once you're done typing it, Odessa can collect the index cards that you... How many of you have index cards just from the raise of hand? Okay, cool. So we're going to wait for someone. All right, over there. Thank you. Yeah, for the meantime that we wait, um, if you can share some resources um, that you've benefited from this campus, um, just uh, spit out any um, sort of resources that you use in this campus or even outside of campus too that have helped you. Uh, navigate this university. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. At the top of the list is STARS. I don't know if there are any other veterans in here or veterans dependents, but um, there's definitely the vets group, which is part of STARS. And um, the other group that I had help from was a group called Calteach, and they are specifically education oriented. They helped me get myself on the path towards education, and they were a huge help. Literally like 20 seconds of a resource. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I agree with STARS, and then also UOP was a good place for me. Okay. Definitely STARS. Um, I couldn't be EOP because my dad graduated while I wasn't in school, so I'm no longer first gen. But um, yeah, definitely go to CAPS. The counseling service is really amazing on, on campus. And CARE. I definitely have leaned on CARE a lot. Um, the DRC, if you feel like you might have some sort of limitations, go get tested because they will help you so much. Who else? Yeah. Yeah, psychologists in the health center and the CAPS, yeah. And um, yeah, also go to slug support if you need financial help. Like don't let anything that's like bothering you in your life outside of school drag you out of school. Yeah, because we have a bunch of questions. <laughs> This is great. All right, just in case if we don't get to respond to every single question that is here, you'll have an opportunity later on to also connect with them. And I would highly advise it for you to do that, okay? So I'll start with the first question and whoever wants to respond. When you started at UC Santa Cruz, did you know anyone? If not, uh, was it hard making new friends? I didn't know anyone. <laughs> 
and mostly, well, as I say, I'm an international student, so I don't really have any family here. I'm all by myself. And uh, when I came at Cabrillo, I mean, I have my American family. And uh, first, when I came here, I was just like, okay, I need to meet new people. I need to do something. So I started looking at clubs, and there is a bunch of clubs in here. And um, so I started working with uh, the global leaders. We were in charge of the orientation for new international students. And also, I joined the Rainbow Theater, which is great, by the way. You should check us out. We are amazing. And it's pretty much like we're trying to represent everybody on the campus, like Latino, American, um, Japanese American, African American, it's a rainbow theater, and we try to represent everybody through shows and poetry. We're doing everything. I mean, I'm not personally an actor or a singer, but yeah, check out check out the rainbow theater. That's that's really a great thing to do. <laughs> um, anybody want to add something? Yeah. Yeah, when I first transferred here, I didn't know a single person that was going to be here in the school, but I luckily I had an extended orientation with DOP. I'm an undocumented student, so they held an ex uh, extended orientation for about a week. And that first group of friends, actually, I have roomed with three of them now, and they're really good friends of mine. And then in class, the first week of class, I just started talking to random people, and that worked for me. <laughs> As an off-campus person, it's just really important to really um, go to events and try and, you know, initiate that contact because you're not getting it from living with people here on campus. Um, I also highly recommend going to the dining halls. I've met some of, like, the, the closest people that I've met since being here by having the time to sit down and break bread with other people. So I highly recommend, even if you don't have a dining plan, maybe try and get in there once or twice through the quarter, go to your college night. It's really, um, it's really helpful. I also didn't know anybody when I first got here, and I quickly connected with a couple of students, uh, a couple of other mathematicians, but I will say that being off campus, I agree, it was, it was hard to connect with people. So I have found a few good people to hang out with. Uh, being in education has found me more good people to be with, but um, it might take a while to really find people to connect with. And, that's normal. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Cool. Is being here as a transfer student an advantage? I think that's a good question. Definitely. See, <laughs> Monka, she definitely an advantage. I, I speak for myself. My community college did a fantastic job at prepping me for the schoolwork and the material. Like I said, it's about transferring those skills. You come in with a different mentality. You come in already having found your major, having found your niche, right? Because many of us transfer, so we come in almost declared, right? We just got to fill out that paper. But other than that, we're pretty much mentally declared. And when you come in here, some of my friends who came in as first years, they're still finding themselves. They're still kind of playing around with the different resources. And when we come in here, we kind of already come hit, hit the ground running. So definitely, definitely see it as an advantage to be a transfer student. The only disadvantage I would say that you get, and there might be a different sentiment on the panel, is uh, the college affiliations. So for me, I'm an Oaks affiliate. So I didn't really, I didn't really, I don't really connect with that community on the level that first years do because everything's catered for them and things are mandatory for those first years. And for transfer, there isn't. They're not, uh, they're not mandatory. So I would say that's the only disadvantage, but that's kind of non-academic. That's more socially. But academic, you're definitely at an advantage. So use that. Anyone else? Cool. All right. This question is mostly for Heather. What would you tell someone who wants to be a marine bio major? Wow, really hammering that one home. Um, it depends on how much drive and initiative you really feel towards the, the topic. Um, it is really inundated with a lot of people that are really passionate. And so you really need to make sure that you're, like, you're getting into those office hours, you're making connections with those professors, you're getting out and getting field experience to know that it's definitely your bag because some people get out on a boat and realize, oh, my God, I get seasick. Like, whoa. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just uh, – 
I chose to downgrade to a biology BA just so that I could go into education if I wanted to as a single parent and, you know, have a schedule better for my child. But yeah, my passion still lies in marine biology and I can still do marine biology things. Um, I'm currently really interested in doing research on sea otters and toxoplasmosis. So like um, really it just depends on how narrow you want to keep your focus. And I wanted to be broad and maybe narrow it more in grad school. Cool. How much interaction with a professor does it take to get into a lab? It feels like we don't have much time, sad face. <laughs> Honestly, it took like one really good conversation. I can't put that in time, but it took like one really good uh, conversation with a professor who's not my thesis professor, Rebecca London. Shout out to me, Professor London. Uh, we talked about her doing research in middle schools and uh, K through 12 on like recess and the effects and outcomes of recess. And I told her like when recess is when I was like doing drugs and like doing all this other stuff. And uh, we just kind of connected. And even though she wasn't looking for more participants, she was like, if you want to hop in, given your experience, come on through. So definitely sometimes uh, being vulnerable, allowing yourself to share things with professors, sometimes your personal experience, the non-academic experiences would correlate with your academic experiences and opportunities will rise. You know, I can honestly say I'm in my like third or fourth lab right now and I'm doing a senior thesis and it all started with that first interaction with, uh, with my professor who's not my thesis professor. So just like if you really are, you know, research savvy and you're like enthused about it, just talk to whatever professor, talk to all your professors and like, ask that question, like, do you have research opportunities for undergrad? And there's other ones too, that after you could come talk to me, there's a CERC, which will open up again next year. Uh, you could ask many questions about that as well. There's definitely opportunities for undergrads to do research around this campus. When I was getting interested in education, I don't have anything that may, that you would specifically call a lab, but as far as research opportunities, it was the same thing. I had a professor that I really connected with. I enjoyed her education class. It was an introduction to mathematics education. And so I just went and talked to her and I would have these extended conversations. And then finally one day she said, hey, I think you should come to, you should get an independent study and come hang out with my graduate cohort so that you can see more of what mathematics education looks like. So just uh, connecting with your professors, talking to them and either you ask them or, you know, if you show enough passion, sometimes they'll just ask you instead. Because you never know when you're in a place where the prof you are exactly what that professor is looking for right now. All right. What motivated you the most when you were feeling low? <laughs> uh, anybody? I mean, I don't know. I don't. I don't really let myself feeling low, just because that's depressing. But I would just say, just thinking about how far you already, you like how far you you are from where you started. Just thinking about all the struggle and also your goal. Why are you doing it? Why you decide to have an education? Why are you here? Like just thinking about all of that. But yeah. Please, something better, anybody. For me, it's always been my family and friends. I just think about them and where I want to be in five years and where I want my family to be. Two things to reiterate, definitely. Talk to my mom a lot and uh, get some feedback from her. Talk to family and friends. Talk to my partner. One thing that I found that helped a lot, though, was get a good night's sleep. There's, there's seriously a lot of times where you put yourself into this mental spiral downward where you kick yourself and then you feel bad about kicking yourself and then you kick yourself even further. And sometimes all you need is just a, a good seven, eight hours to snap yourself out of it because it'll look different in the morning. And even if it doesn't, more opportunities or solutions might present themselves for you to start looking through to deal with whatever is has got you down so take care of yourself cool. this question is for uncle 
What's been your biggest challenge as a sober student and the most important tools you found? Whoever wrote that, thank you for the question. Uh, my biggest challenge is helping my, my friends, my carnales, grapple with uh, trying to get sober or harm reduction. Uh, for me, luckily, I'm in my fifth year, so I'm a, lot, I'm a lot more grounded in my personal framework. And I have my people that I talk to. Uh, this kind of connects to the previous question. Uh, I remind myself where I don't want to be. I don't want to be locked up again, and I don't want to be homeless again. Uh, so I think about that. But my biggest struggle has been how do I help those individuals in my life who are not coming to me as an employee like in the space, but coming to me as a friend, as a comrade? How do I help them? Uh, from my vantage point to the best of my ability. And uh, one of the things that I do is I just listen. I listen. I remember what I wanted when I was trying to get sober. And my jefito would tell me, like, yeah, ya no tomes, don't drink no more. Uh, don't do coca or whatever, you know. And I would just listen to my friends or whoever would come in, and I'd say, well, why do you do it? Like, let's talk about it. You know, well, how did you feel when you were using like, did you feel low? Did somebody disrespect you? Did you have a horrible relationship with your professor? Like, we try to deconstruct it. And I've seen that that helps those students because they're just like, well, like nobody has sat down and actually asked me like why I made those decisions. And with like, with no judgment whatsoever, it's just like, we're just having a conversation and trying to help other people understand why they do certain things. Because some of us don't know that we have a problem until it's too late. I'm one of them. So that's one of the things that I do. And again, we open up the code. We throw sober events on campus. We got a beach bonfire next week on the 26th. If you want to come out and party with your boy, we're going to get down. Uh, <laughs> so it's going to be good. But we're just trying to foster community. I'm definitely trying to foster a sober community or a harm reduction community where maybe you drink 10 beers a week and you want to cut down to like three. You know, that's your version of self-care. That's your version of recovery for yourself. And uh, we accept that. We're trying to redefine the definition of a recovery and we're trying to foster a new a new tomorrow for that so thank you for the question unfortunately we don't have enough time to answer the following questions but um like i want to i want to reiterate the fact that these are people here for you to answer these questions any question any um resource that they might have um, they know it because they've dealt with it. So um, I encourage you to um, connect with them, talk to them, ask them more, because um, I know for a fact that they'll be willing to, to help out. And I also want to thank um, the student panel, honestly. Um, a round of applause for them. Because with, with all honesty, um, this a student panel, what it developed was because of the things that you had to deal with, right? And you've he you're here, you're pushing through, you're excelling, you're still dealing with a lot of the challenges, but um, we know for a fact that we see the work that you're doing. We see your challenges, and we're here to um, advocate for you, but also to congratulate you, right? So thank you so much, and thank you for participating in the student panel. Oh, before Sarah wants to make an announcement. Thanks, y'all. We'll see you November 2nd, 1.30 to 2.30 to hear about how to transform the world through research uh, and making a difference in the world. Take care, y'all. And be safe next week in solidarity to our uh, labor strikers. Thank you.